Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the museum's Walter and Leonore Annenberg Theater. I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. We, we welcome you all here tonight to celebrate the museum and the First Amendment and to look forward to a new chapter. I'd like to recognize several of the museum's founding partners whom we are so pleased to have here with us this evening. Leslie Hill and Dennis Carroll, Brian and Myra Greenspun, Arthur Sulzberger Jr., and Robin Sproul. We are also honored to have several of our trustees and trustee emeriti in attendance. Jim Abbott, Shelby Coffey, Mike Coleman, Phil Curry, R. David Edelman, Felix Gutierrez, Jack Kirschenbaum, Malcolm Kirschenbaum, John Lee, Charles Overby, Peter Pritchard, Orange Quarles, Mike Regan, John Siegenthaler, Mark Trahant, and Barbara Wall. After more than 11 years, the museum will close its doors here on Pennsylvania Avenue at the end of this month. And while the museum's closing saddens us, we are also heartened that nearly 10 million visitors walk through our doors to experience the story of news, the role of a free press in major events in history, and how the core freedoms of the First Amendment, religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition apply to their lives. We thank everyone who has visited, but we are especially grateful to all of you here in this room. Members, donors, founding partners, trustees, and staff, for your belief in our mission and in the importance of our work. Over the past 11 years, your support has helped us provide hundreds of programs like this one tonight on topics ranging from politics to journalism to current events and to present 60 new exhibits covering subjects like presidential elections, political satire, Hurricane Katrina, the Kennedy assassination, and the Stonewall Inn protests, and even the movie Anchorman and the world champion Washington Nationals. You've helped us champion the five freedoms of the First Amendment and further the museum's mission to increase public understanding about the importance of a free and fair press. The museum and all it stands for would not have been possible without all of you, and we thank you for being part of our story. We will begin tonight's program with a celebration of the museum, followed by our keynote speakers, who will each talk about what the First Amendment means to them and how they use it in their daily work. We are honored to have as our speakers tonight, journalist and matter of fact host, Soledad O'Brien, First Amendment expert and champion, Floyd Abrams, DC Congresswoman and civil rights pioneer, Eleanor Holmes Norton, and Fox News Sunday host and veteran journalist, Chris Wallace. Unfortunately, we heard just this afternoon that Congressman John Lewis will not be able to join us due to a last minute scheduling conflict and he sends his regrets. Later in the program, we will hear from five individuals who have used the five freedoms of the First Amendment to affect change in their communities. Joining us for a short panel discussion will be Charles Watson, Jr. of the Baptist Joint Committee, an ardent activist for religious freedom. Anne Haveman, who uses the power of assembly in her work at the Chesapeake Climate Action Network to raise awareness of global warming and Donna Redmond Jones, Virginia Brown, and Nicola Schmidt, a principal and two students from a local high school who used the power of speech and petition to create a dialogue over a controversial issue that rankled their school earlier this year. Lata Knott, executive director of our First Amendment Center, will moderate the conversation. We hope you will all join us after the program 
for a reception in the museum, giving us all the opportunity to toast the museum and our First Amendment mission. And before you leave tonight, please take a moment to sign the guest book that's located outside the theater on level one. It is now my great pleasure to introduce someone who has been an integral part of the museum since its inception, Peter Pritchard. In 1995, Al Newharth and Charles Overby displayed keen judgment and remarkable powers of persuasion when they convinced Peter to leave his position as editor of USA Today to become executive director of the museum in charge of the creation and construction of the first museum in Arlington. Peter subsequently served in roles as president of the museum, president of the Freedom Forum, and chair and chief executive officer of the museum. And when the decision was made to move the museum across the river to the district, Peter agreed to don his hard hat once again to oversee the construction of this magnificent building on Pennsylvania Avenue. Please join me in welcoming the chair of the museum's board of trustees, Peter Pritchard. Thanks, Jan. Uh, when we launched this museum on Pennsylvania Avenue in 2008, I really didn't expect that we would be closing it in a mere 11 years. Uh, but before I say much more, as long as we're thanking people, I think we should thank some of the people who made this museum such a resounding and memorable success with visitors. For many years, it has been one of the most popular museums in Washington. It has been recognized around the world for the excellence of its exhibits, its programs, and its welcoming attitude toward everyone who ever walked through the doors. So please, let's take one moment to thank the current leader of the Freedom Forum, our most excellent chair, Jan Newharth, and all of our employees, both full and part-time, and all of our generous friends and donors and volunteers who contributed so much to this success. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Naturally, when an excellent institution like this has to close, people ask why. There are many reasons. First, those of us who planned it, including our founder, Al Newharth, our very capable longtime CEO, Charles Overby, and many other managers and trustees, including me, made this museum too large. We thought big, we wanted to make an impact, and so this was a very ambitious, visionary project. Unfortunately, it also turned out to be very expensive, too expensive over time for its main funder, the Freedom Forum, to operate. Despite spending more than $500 million from the Freedom Forum, and nearly 150 million that we raised from very generous donors, both large and small, the museum was never able to break even. Our smallest annual operating deficit was in the $7 million range, and the largest driven by rising interest rates was more than 30 million. Unfortunately, our foundation just couldn't sustain those losses over time. There were also some macro trends that created serious headwinds. The development of this museum coincided with the digital hurricane that swept over old school traditional media. F newspapers large and small were decimated. Fairness and obje objectivity in news reporting deteriorated or in some cases disappeared. And some politicians found that blaming journalists was an attractive political vein to mine. So the traditional media, a natural base of support for the museum, was left economically weakened and held in low regard by the public. We also opened the museum in the midst of a recession, and the fallout from that greatly increased over time annual interest payments on our debt. And because we received no money from government entities, we wanted to remain independent, we had to charge an admission fee of more than $20. That was in line with museums around the country and around the world, but quite high for Washington, where our great government-funded institutions are free. And we underestimated how hard it would be to break even when the competition is free. But so much for the tedious financial details. The good news is we had a great run. 
In our nearly 12 years on Pennsylvania Avenue, we have welcomed more than 10 million visitors, and most of them found the museum to be an entertaining and educational experience. We've received accolades from critics and visitors from around the world. The users of TripAdvisor have ranked us in the top five Washington attractions for six years in a row. Here are three representative comments from recent visitors. It is really hard to put into words how impressive this museum is. History unfolds at each turn. This is a must see. We travel a lot and visit a lot of museums. The museum is by far the very best. This is a world class museum. I regard this museum as among the most important sites to visit in Washington. The museum is dedicated to free speech, the hallmark of a free society. Sadly, the museum will be closing at the end of the year, so I encourage you to visit. This museum is more relevant now than in any time in our nation's history. So what did the museum accomplish? First, through our many exhibits and forums, we helped visitors understand how crucial all of the freedoms of the First Amendment are to a functioning democracy. Most Americans take these freedoms for granted. But tonight, I hope you'll remind yourselves how valuable they really are. And there they are uh, for you to see. Freedom of religion, of speech, of the press, of assembly, and of petition. We used to have in the Freedom Forum a very active international program, and we would do forums all over the world. And everywhere we went, the uh, journalists and visitors who came to those forums said, you Americans are so lucky to have your First Amendment. We should always remember that. Next, through our popular digital educational programs, we helped middle and high school students learn how to critically assess news reports and how to tell fact from fiction in the Wild West environment of the internet. These programs now reach more than 10 million students in middle and high schools in the United States and many countries around the world, and they will continue as we move forward. We also reminded visitors about how much good journalism can accomplish, at least when reporters and editors are at their best. Inscribed on the wall up on the sixth floor are these words, which I hope you will also remember. That inscription says, and every visitor passes by it almost, the free press is a cornerstone of democracy. People have a need to know. Journalists have a right to tell. Finding the facts can be difficult. Reporting the story can be dangerous. Freedom includes the right to be outrageous. Responsibility includes the duty to be fair. News is history in the making. Journalists provide the first draft of history. A free press at its best reveals the truth. As that creed shows, journalism can be a noble calling. And I think the museum was a noble effort. From a commercial point of view, yes, we faltered. But we left millions of visitors delighted with our sizzle and our substance. We helped millions of people understand what their bedrock freedoms are, what they mean, and why it's important to exercise them so that they never, ever atrophy. We help them understand the crucial role journalism plays in a free society and why it deserves constitutional protection. So not only did the museum have a good run, but I would submit that we did a lot of good and made a difference in the lives of many visitors. And I like to think that there are a few hundred young journalists out there now who first got interested in this craft because they came to the museum and now they're doing their best to help the public understand the complex issues of the day. One of them is an LA-based reporter, Ethan Millman, who last week tweeted, I visited the museum as a 17-year-old, unsure if I wanted to pursue a career in such a turbulent, unpredictable industry. The museum captured everything journalism stands for and left me with no doubt I needed to be a reporter. It will be missed. I'm going to close with a quote from one of my heroes, Winston Spencer Churchill, the only politician to ever win the Nobel Prize for Literature, 
a record that may stand forever. <laughs> <coughs> Churchill said, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Or as our founder, Al Newharth, once said, don't just learn something from every experience, learn something positive. We don't know yet if we'll ever be able to build a third museum, but we can promise you this, the museum's important work will continue. It may be in a different form and on different platforms, but it will continue. And thank you so much for all that so many of you did to further this noble cause. And now we have a video tribute to the museum. Thank you. First Amendment is precious, almost sacred, and that's why it is so fitting and appropriate that this museum was built to show the role of the press in our society and to the immutable principles embodied in the First Amendment. We are delighted to welcome you to this opening ceremony of this museum. This modest little uh, museum of news to use for the public as well as the press. The opening of the Freedom Forum Museum is a dream come true for reporters like myself who have always longed for a better public understanding of the role of the media and the importance of freedom of the press in our society. Start the presses, the museum is officially open. The museum finds a new home in downtown Washington. This museum is by far one of the great attractions in Washington, D.C. Two, one. You're super excited. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this museum is pretty impressive. There's so much that you could see and it's constantly changing. There's something new here all the time. Every time you turn around, there's a memorable quote or a face or a moment that does resonate. I don't think I've ever felt this way about a museum. There's something about the still moment, that moment in time that does touch people. The work of this institution, the museum, and the heroes it celebrates are so very important. It's our opportunity to remember a group of journalists who were willing, in many cases, to give their lives in pursuit of the truth. We honor him now, not only by our words, but our deeds. Austin Tice, the missing American journalist kidnapped in Syria. The museum wants to encourage people to consider what their world would be like without journalists to bring them the news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Why can't we just have the truth? We have something very special here in the United States, the First Amendment. Anybody who talks about abridging the First Amendment is doing something very dangerous. I always think of the museum as the home of freedom. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. In this room, at this time, every day of the year, we give a day. The museum is the country, and we hold it collectively inside of us. And it's up to us to continue what the museum is doing.
that video was produced in-house by our very own Doug Yuan, and I would love it if you would all just please join me in giving him a round of applause. Our first speaker tonight is someone very familiar with not only the mission of the museum, but the building itself. Each week, Soledad O'Brien tapes her political magazine program, Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien, right here in the Night TV studio. Soledad is an award-winning journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist, and is CEO of Starfish Media Group, a multi-platform media production company dedicated to telling empowering and authentic stories on a range of social issues. She also reports regularly for HBO's Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel and PBS NewsHour. In her distinguished career, Soledad has anchored two CNN programs, co-anchored Weekend Today, and contributed to Today and NBC Nightly News. Unfortunately, a last-minute family matter precluded her from joining us live tonight, but Soledad was kind enough to deliver this taped message. Congratulations to all of you. You should be so incredibly proud of what you've accomplished over the last nearly dozen years that the museum has been here, more than 11 years 10 million visitors. We shot our show right upstairs because there was no better place to highlight the importance of journalism that's based in fact and that centers the stories of people, not politicians, even in a city that is built on politics. It was an honor to work with the professional team here at the museum. Okay, sometimes there was a little dancing in the hallways and sometimes, yes, I was involved. But this museum, whether it's in Arlington or here on Pennsylvania Avenue or wherever it ultimately lives, is not about a location, and it never was. As amazing and as beautiful as this space is, it was always about celebrating the First Amendment. Written on the side of this building, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And at a time when so few seem to know the details of what the actual Constitution says, places like this are critical. So, I'm not going to say goodbye, but so long for now. The mission of a museum dedicated to understanding the critical job of the fourth estate, the news media. And more importantly, understanding that the media's job is to serve and inform the public will never be bound by just a building. Instead, it lives in the hearts and minds of all of us. Our next speaker is an award-winning legal scholar and America's best-known First Amendment lawyer, Floyd Abrams. He has argued frequently in the Supreme Court in First Amendment cases, including when he represented the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case and successfully stopped the Nixon administration from preventing the Times from publishing material related to the effort in Vietnam. Floyd's senior counsel in Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell's lit litigation practice, and he is the author of the recent book, The Soul of the First Amendment, which examines how American law protects free speech. Please welcome Floyd Abrams. Thank you, I'm very proud to be here today. And I want to start by thanking all the people here who made this great museum possible and made it uh, what it is, uh, a champion of the protection of First Amendment rights in the country uh, and one of the great teachers about the nature of the First Amendment. Uh, I wanted to start out by just quoting to you a, a statute from a different country in a different time. What it said was that five to 15 year sentences could be imposed for the publication of, quote, false or exaggerated news, unquote, of such nature as to, quote, harm the national interest, unquote. 
Uh, that was a 1925 statute in Italy, adopted uh, within a year after Mussolini took power there. And it, it occurred to me, in just thinking of saying a few words tonight, how easy it is sometimes, how almost thoughtlessly we take the First Amendment without thinking of it, uh, without thinking, for one thing, about how different we are uh, than the rest of the world, certainly a Mussolini-like world, but, but uh, really every country. Uh, the Pentagon Papers case, by way of example, is one which would not have come out that way in other democratic countries, truly democratic countries, uh, where they have an enormous amount of freedom. The idea, think of it, the idea in the middle of a war where American POWs were being held and the government were going to court to say that publication of certain top secret, so designated, material uh, would, would Im interfere with ending the war, getting our soldiers back, and the like. Uh, I mean, I spoke to lawyers from Canada, uh, England, lots of countries around the world. They were stunned at the result. Uh, and here, it's part of our history now, uh, but, but we don't often enough, I think, celebrate, as this museum has, not just that case, but the degree to which we are unique in the world uh, and the degree to, uh, with respect to all uh, of these freedoms. Uh, let me mention one recent uh, example. Uh, in which I was involved, uh, I've never needed the First Amendment. I've never taken really radical positions on anything, and I have the press behind me. You know, so I gave a speech uh, a month ago at Duke Law School, and I was describing a case uh, uh, in which the, the organization, which you may know of, which goes to churches that are mourning the deaths of American soldiers, Westboro Baptist Church, that's what I'm talking about, uh, with signs as close as the police will allow them to be to the churches, uh, denouncing the dead soldiers and saying that this is God's punishment uh, because the United States is too accommodating to gay people. So I use that as an example in my talk of the extraordinary degree of First Amendment protection that we would protect them, the speakers, when their conduct was so offensive, so outrageous, so, so contrary to norms of human uh, behavior. Uh, it wasn't a controversial speech except that the organization then denounced me uh, and had a rally uh, 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 outside the uh, campus uh, with my name on it. Uh, just so you know, uh, it's not that well known. So I, I, I don't usually get involved in situations uh, uh, like that. And, and I, I was struck again even then here. Uh, you know, just think of it. The, the idea, first of all, that we would protect such speech. I'm, I tell you, it is unique in the world that that speech would be protected in a lawsuit brought by the father of the, a deceased soldier who was being denounced uh, viciously and in the ugliest possible way. Um, and that it should be followed by the exercise of First Amendment rights by that same organization after I had described the case. Uh, and while you know, what they had to say about their case was of, of only passing interest, it just seems to be almost a marvelous example 
of the degree to which we take the extra step, more than the extra step, uh, in protecting even vile speech, let alone speech, uh, that deals with current issues, major issues, that offends the government, uh, that leads the public to be furious uh, at the press. Uh, and so I, I leave you tonight just saying what a, a joy it is to have been here on a number of occasions, to have had the chance uh, to walk around this great edifice celebrating the protection of uh, freedom of the press in particular and all the other uh, not insignificant uh, rights protected uh, by the First Amendment. Uh, it was an accident that the First Amendment is first. It had been third initially, but the, the first two proposed amendments uh, were not ratified. But the firstness of the First Amendment has come to have a very special role in our jurisprudence. Uh, and I tip my hat and I thank again all of you that have made possible this extraordinary place and who will continue uh, to defend and explain uh, and celebrate the First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful remarks, Floyd. I think we'll use that line, the firstness of the First Amendment, often at this organization. Our third speaker was here for the opening of the museum in 2008, and we are honored that she returned for tonight's program. Eleanor Holmes Norton is in her 15th term as a congresswoman woman for the District of Columbia. She is the chair of the House Subcommittee on Highways and Transit and serves on the Committee on Oversight and Reform and the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Before her congressional service, President Jimmy Carter appointed her to serve as the first woman to chair the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She came to Congress as a national figure who had been a civil rights leader as an organizer with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who helped organize the March on Washington. She also appeared here at the museum in 2015 to help us recognize the 50th anniversary of the historic Voting Rights Act. Please welcome Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you for your kind introduction. I remember that day. This was a useless corner. <laughs> the district had used this corner for a building that was of not much use to anyone. And I was so proud <laughs> that this corner was going to be used for one of the cornerstones of our Constitution. I don't know about the rest of you, but I do not come uh, as with a funeral. Not when we consider what the subject matter is today. Since the museum was open, millions of tourists, visitors from every part of the world, stop at this site sometimes on their way to the Capitol, and you can see the Capitol from here. They come to a museum unlike any that I have heard of in the world, devoted uniquely to the First Amendment. Unobstructed, you can see the Capitol where it belonged. The sighting could not have been more right. So I regret any notion of losing the museum today. Well, for two reasons when I think about it. First is the disappearance of so many newspapers and the difficulties, pure news, 
outlets have in our country today. We need, we need a reminder of what the First Amendment has meant to our country. But second, is very sorrowful to me. It is evidence that the First Amendment itself is losing, is losing currency, particularly among, of all people, young people who must depend, who we must depend upon to carry forward the First Amendment traditions. And let me tell you the evidence in preparing for my remarks that I came upon. It's a Brookings Institution survey who examined where college students' views stand on the First Amendment. And here the Brookings Amendment found, and here I'm quoting them, freedom of expression is deeply imperiled on US campuses, end quote. And to show what they mean, they cite a significant number of college students who believe that hate speech is not protected by the First Amendment. 51% believe that shouting down a controversial speaker so that she cannot be heard is acceptable. 63% were Democrats and 38% were Republicans and Brookings warns that bear in mind that most controversial speakers today on campuses are from the far right. At the same time, this is a generation that is very effectively using the First Amendment to protest for issues they favor, like gun safety. That's an issue being led by young people. Uh, the notion that they would be intolerant to the underside may mean that we all have to do something to help them relearn the reasons the framers added the Bill of Rights and especially the First Amendment to our nation's constitution in the first place. I have to concede that for me, the First Amendment is very personal. I'm a third generation Washingtonian, born and raised in our nation's capital. I went to segregated public schools in the District of Columbia. That in a city that even then was supposed to symbolize the essence of American freedom. Not only was the nation's capital racially segregated, this city had no home rule, that's what we call it. That simply means self-governance. The city was governed by the Congress and the federal government. And of course, there was no person like me to represent the district in the Congress. But we had one thing we had the First Amendment. So we advocated our way to freedom and equality, and we have it in this city today. I don't know if my childhood helped me develop an appreciation for the First Amendment. I do remember that as a young lawyer, not long out of law school, and for that matter, the civil rights movement, I got to argue a case in the United States Supreme Court representing an unabashed racist organization that had been barred by what we in the law call prior restraint. That was a court order that kept this organization from appearing again after it had already appeared uh, and engaged in racist and anti-Semitic remarks at a rally. 
I remember another case I argued in New York when the liberal mayor of New York City, John Lindsay, denied the notorious Alabama Governor George Wallace a permit uh, to speak at a public facility, Shea Stadium. Uh, I went into Queen's Supreme Court to overturn that decision. Now, I can't say to you that I broke any new ground. Those were not difficult cases in light of controlling precedent. My direct cl clients were a minority in American society, proselytizing racists with whom I had nothing in common. Yet it was clear to me that my ultimate client was the First Amendment. So in my own life, in my life as a lawyer, I have regarded the First Amendment as a tool, a tool like none other for change. And I remind us all that it remains so. Shakespeare might have said, let's kill all the lawyers. But it didn't say kill the First Amendment. <laughs> this amendment remains a tool for whatever change we may desire. The museum, located so close to the Capitol, in my judgment, is irreplaceable. I, for one, who grew up never giving up, am not prepared to write the epitaph, even as I am grateful for the unique contributions of the museum. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you, Eleanor. None of us are prepared to write an epitaph. That's a good thing. Our final speaker is uh, a warrior journalist who's a mainstay of the Sunday talk shows. Chris Wallace is the anchor of Fox News Sunday, and in his 14-year career at Fox has participated in coverage of nearly every major political event and had major interviews with presidents and politicians at the highest level of government. As Soledad O'Brien said recently, Chris Wallace is not afraid of his guests. He is a very tough interviewer. I know I don't think I would like to be interviewed by Chris. I can't understand where he got that inclination in his life. Uh, before joining Fox, Chris worked 14 years at ABC News on Primetime Thursday, uh, Primetime Thursday and Nightline. And before that, he worked for NBC as the chief White House correspondent. He also moderated Meet the Press for a while, making him the only person to have hosted two Sunday talk shows. Please welcome Chris Wallace. Thank you. Yeah, I can't imagine where I would have gotten that inclination either. In fact, someone once said to me, if you hadn't been a reporter, what would you have done? And I said, I have absolutely no idea. I now know how to do nothing else except be a reporter. You know, I was looking at the video, and it brought back some memories, because I remember one Saturday afternoon a long time ago, when I took my kids, who were my twins, who were about 12, to the museum over in Arlington or Rosslyn or whatever you call that area over there, and I couldn't find a place to park. It was a little hard. You could, you could see it, but you couldn't quite get there. My kids were not thrilled. Um, we got there. We ended up involved in an interactive thing about how to cover reporters, and they got kind of engaged in it, but Dad, please don't ever do this to us again. A um, few years later, the museum was here. I brought them here. They saw this magnificent uh, building and museum and all of the uh, wonderful exhibits you have here. Uh, and I think for the first time maybe in their lives, they were a little proud of what their old man did, so I thank you very much. <laughs> I want to 
talk a little bit this evening about the First Amendment, but also the challenges to the First Amendment and the challenges inside the news business. A lot of people come up to the, me these days and say how fair I am. Some even say that I'm a voice of reason, which those twins and my other children find absolutely hilarious. Now, don't get me wrong, I like compliments as much as the next guy, but I find this particular compliment kind of depressing. Why? Because when I started in the news business a half century ago, working as a reporter for the Boston Globe, fairness was not something to be singled out. It was the basic minimum requirement for your job. People might praise you for your reporting or for your writing or later for how you were on the air, but fairness was what kept you from getting fired. Now it stands out. This is something that I think all of us in the news business need to think about, need to take very seriously. I believe that President Trump is engaged in the most direct, sustained assault on freedom of the press in our history. And I will get to that in a moment. Before you applaud, listen to the rest of this. Because I think many of our colleagues in the news business see the president's attacks, his constant bashing of the media as a rationale, as an excuse to cross the line themselves to push back. And that is a big mistake. I see it all the time on the front page of major newspapers and the lead of the evening news, fact mixed with opinion, buzzwords like bombshell and scandal, the animus of the reporter and the editor as plain to see as the headline. Two days after Donald Trump was elected president, two days, this was the sentence in the lead story in the New York Times. The American political establishment reeled on Wednesday as leaders in both parties became, began coming to grips with four years of President Donald J. Trump in the White House, a once unimaginable scenario that has now plunged the United States and its allies into a period of deep uncertainty about the policies and impact of this administration. There's a lot to unpack in that one sentence. It hasn't stopped since. I, I know this is going to be controversial, but I came here today from having spent all day at Fox News covering the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on the IG report. Some things in the report, very supportive of what the FBI did, some of it very critical. We covered it all. One of our fellow networks, CNN today, ignored the IG report, ignored all of the statements about terrible misconduct, perhaps illegality on the part of the FBI in its seeking of the, FBI, of the FISA warrants against Carter Page. Now, the last time I checked, CNN was pretty interested in the Russia investigation, but they didn't seem interested in this. The fact is, to be clear, the president has given us plenty to work with, but when we respond to him like that, we are playing, when we respond with bias, we're playing his game, not ours. We are not participants in what we cover. We are umpires or observers trying to be objective witnesses to what is going on. If the president or anyone we're covering says something untrue or does something questionable, we can and should report it. But we shouldn't be drawn into the fight. We shouldn't be drawn into taking sides as tempting as that is. We're not as good at it as they are, and we're abandoning the special role the founders gave us in this democracy. Now, let's talk about the president. He has done everything he can to undercut the media, to try to delegitimize us. And I think his purpose is clear, to raise doubts when we report critically about him and his administration that we can be trusted. Back in 2017, he tweeted something that said far more about him than it did about us. Quote, the fake news media is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the American people. After that statement, retired 
um, Admiral Bill McRaven, a Navy SEAL for 37 years, the man in charge of the missions that captured Saddam Hussein and that took down Osama bin Laden, Bill McRaven said this, quote, this sentiment may be the greatest threat to democracy in my lifetime. Now, I got to say, I was a little surprised by that. Remember, this is a guy who fought the Soviet Union. This is a, an admiral who fought Islamic terrorism. But when I asked Bill about this, this was his response. Those threats, the Soviets, Islamic terrorism, those threats brought us together. Both the president and I swore an oath to the Constitution. And the First Amendment to that Constitution is freedom of the press. When the president says the media is the enemy of the people, to me, that undermines the Constitution. So I do think it is a tremendous threat to our democracy. Let's be honest, the president's attacks have done some damage. A Freedom Forum Institute poll associated here with the museum this year found that 29% of Americans, almost a third of all of us, think the First Amendment goes too far. And 77%, three quarters, say that fake news is a serious threat to our democracy. But on this night, as we celebrate freedom of the press and we commemorate the museum, I think we should remember some essential truths. First, ours is a great profession, maybe the best that anybody ever thought of as a way to make a living. Think of it, we get paid to tell the truth. How many people can say that? To cut through all the spin, all the distractions, and to tell the American people what is really going on. What our leaders are really doing, what's happening in our schools, and in our hospitals, in our neighborhoods, and with our environment. I have been blessed to do this for 50 years. I spent a week with Mother Teresa in Calcutta just after she'd won the Nobel Peace Prize. I covered President Reagan for six years, going with him to China and the Korean DMZ and covering four Reagan-Gorbachev summits. Last year, I interviewed Vladimir Putin in Helsinki just after that summit, and I asked him, why do so many of the people who oppose you end up dead? <laughs> and I lived to tell the tale. Sure, we take our share of incoming. A couple of weeks ago, President Trump tweeted after one of my interviews, Steve Scalise blew away the nasty and obnoxious Chris Wallace. Afterwards, one of my sons said, nasty, no. Obnoxious, well. <laughs> the bottom line is we have seen presidents come and go. We will endure. So will freedom of the press. And so I am confident with the museum. Thank you all so much. The nation's founders felt the five core freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition, when combined into a single amendment, would really protect the mind, the spirit, and the heart of democracy. The First Amendment protects our right to talk to each other, to develop consensus, and to express our views in ways that we wish without fear of being punished by the government. Eliminate any one of those core freedoms and we lose what our founders felt was our right to act according to our conscience and our opinions. And we're not truly free. The freedom of speech is probably the freedom that everyone is most familiar with. It prevents the government from censoring or punishing us for our speech. Freedom of speech applies to more than just the words that come out of our mouths. It also encompasses things like writing, clothing, symbolic speech, like flashing a peace sign. And it's evolved with the times to include things like movies and video games and online content. Free speech does have its limits. For example, the First Amendment will not protect you if you use it to threaten someone's life or to incite others to commit immediate acts of violence. And, and this is where people get confused, it only applies to the government. Free speech will not protect you from your employer or private organizations. We all use this powerful right to express ourselves every day when we argue with each other, when we create art, and when we criticize the people in power. Thanks to the First Amendment, we can do all of these things without having to fear the government punishing us for what we have to say. 
Freedom of the press means the government has no right to stop the publication of important information about the government, powerful people, current events. Without freedom of the press, many Americans would have been unaware of the horrors of segregation. Without freedom of the press, Americans would not have known that the government had lied to them about how well the Vietnam War was going. More recently, without freedom of the press, we would not have known about the systemic sexual abuse against women on the USA Gymnastics team. Freedom of the press is under attack today by powerful people who call factual reporting that they don't like fake news. Press freedom is also under attack by powerful people all around the world who are repressing reporters and journalists who are simply doing their job to report the news. Freedom of the press is essential to our democracy. People need to be informed citizens, read different news sources, listen to the news, get a variety of sources, get a variety of opinions, support your local news organization. Freedom of religion is simply a person's legal right to practice whatever religion they have or to not have a religion, and that is without government interference. It allows people to live out their beliefs publicly and peacefully at work, at home, at school, in the community, as human beings. Religious freedom allows a sick man to wear his turban to work, a Muslim girl to wear her hijab at sporting events. This is why religious freedom matters. Educate yourself about religious freedom as a constitutional and human right. Get to know your neighbor. Grab your neighbor for a cup of coffee. Engage in conversations about religious identity and gain a better understanding of someone who has a different belief system than what you have. And then at the same time, when these issues arise in your community, be an advocate by contacting your local, state, and national representatives to educate them about these issues and the importance of protecting religious freedom for all. The freedom of assembly is the right to peaceably gather and meet without government interference. When we think of freedom of assembly, we think of large-scale protests where people gather to express a point of view. We think of the women's suffrage procession, the March on Washington, the March for Life. There are also much smaller ways in which the right to assemble impacts our daily lives. It ensures the right to come together to hold public meetings and form associations. This can mean participating in a local parade, joining a flash mob event, or attending a PTA meeting. It's critical to maintain the right to peaceably assemble, even for those whose ideas you disagree. The freedom of assembly is crucial for fostering an open and tolerant society. Freedom of petition is often seen as the orphan freedom. It's the least likely to be mentioned when Americans think of the core freedoms of the First Amendment. Freedom of petition is the right of all of us to go to our government to ask for change, to correct an injustice without the fear of government punishment. This includes the right to collect signatures for a cause and to lobby legislative bodies for or against legislation. I think the general public often thinks of celebrities when it comes to petition. They think of a celebrity going to the White House or testifying on Capitol Hill. But petition is a right for all of us. We can pick up the phone and speak to our congressmen. We can collect signatures. We can go to town halls. We can ask for change. Good evening, I'm Gene Polosinski, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Freedom Forum Institute. And as you've just heard, those five freedoms of the First Amendment apply to us all, and they also power our democracy. Uh, we're certainly here tonight to celebrate the work and the legacy of the museum, but as I've been saying to colleagues and friends and visitors and supporters of the First Amendment throughout the last year or so, we're not simply a magnificent building with a great mission. Rather, we are a magnificent mission that is operated out of a great building. The building will close, but the work will go on. That magnificent mission of defending and explaining and educating about our First Amendment freedoms, that will continue. The First Amendment will also continue to have champions in high places and in regular life who use and defend what I call the Blue Collar Amendment, part of our Bill of Rights. And we may or may not use all the other freedoms protected and rights protected by the Bill of Rights, but the First Amendment is hard at work with us every day, protecting our rights to believe what we will, to speak and write as we wish, and to seek change, either as an individual citizen or in the company of like-minded citizens for the betterment of us all. 
So now we get to turn to some of those real life champions of the First Amendment in a discussion moderated by my colleague, Lada Knott, Executive Director of our First Amendment Center. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. When we discuss the First Amendment, we have a tendency to focus on cases, on controversies, and sometimes we lose sight of just what you can do with your First Amendment rights when you practice them. So on this panel, we're going to hear from people who have used their First Amendment freedoms to educate others, to raise awareness about important issues, and to change minds. And thank you all so much for being here with me. With us tonight, we have Charles Watson, Jr. He's the Director of Education at the BJC, an organization that's dedicated to helping all Americans uh, ha uh, retain the right to practice their spiritual beliefs as they see fit. We also have Anne Haveman, who is the General Counsel for the Chesapeake Climate Action Fund, a nonprofit grassroots organization that's dedicated to fighting global warming in Maryland, Virginia, and, DC, and Washington, DC. We also have three alumni of Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. Um, Donna Redmond Jones is the former principal of that high school who worked with uh, then seniors, Virginia Brown and Nicholas Schmidt to fight back against a culture of toxic masculinity within the school. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing, for sharing your stories with us tonight. I thought we could start with Charles because Charles, you are an advocate for religious freedom and religious freedom is actually the first freedom mentioned in the First Amendment and the importance of firstness says that uh, that's the direction we go. Okay, good. Um, so your work involves educating youth about how religious freedom works. Why is that important and what do you, what do you want to convey to them? Uh, it's important because one of my heroes, Muhammad Ali, um, once said, you know, if you're the same person at 20 that you are at 50, then you've wasted your life. And so if, if I'm talking to students, I want them to know that they need that freedom of religion to be able to say, you, you may change your mind one day on what you believe. You know, the freedom of religion is, is your freedom to believe and to practice your religion as long as you're not hurting somebody else without government interfer interference. And also to not have a religious belief. If you can't say no, then your yes is meaningless. And so we, we, we try to practice that at the BJC and, and have that for everybody. And the students kind of pick up on that because they realize, oh, you know, I used to think this about this uh, band. I used to think they were the greatest band ever. And then two years later, oh, I don't know. I don't like them anymore. I'm embarrassed I'm by that. I'm embarrassed by that, yeah. So the, trying to get to them and know that you're gonna, you may change your mind one day about something and you need that freedom to be able to do it. So it's interesting is that your organization, um, the BJC, that stands for Baptist Joint Committee. Um, but you don't just advocate for the, the religious rights of Baptists or even Christians, but also Hindus, Muslims, atheists. Right. Why is that? Well, uh, as Abrams said earlier about a Westboro Baptist, I spend a lot of my time saying not that type of Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> Baptists actually fought for religious liberty here in, in America in the colonial days. Now, we didn't get everything right at that time, but uh, we realized that we were thrown in jail for preaching without a license, and we never want that to happen to us, but more importantly, we never want that to happen to anyone else. And so we feel it's important that everybody has the same freedom. There's no such thing as a second-class citizen, so there's no such thing as a second-class religion. Everybody should be treated different, the same. Even the people that don't have a religious faith, they're citizens. They're here, and we should be able to treat them the same as everybody else. So that's why we protect everybody because we know we have some weird ways as Baptists and we want them protected too. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to you personally, um, since you've made this your life's work, what, uh, what is it about religious freedom that's personally, specifically important to you? Um, I, I've said this many times, but for me, um, as an African American, I don't like anything um, that doesn't give me full freedom. Uh, I tell people I don't want to biblical noose around my neck and I don't want a religious chains around my feet. I want to be able to practice whatever religion I want to practice or practice none. And the next day turn around and do something different. That's true freedom. 
if I'm not allowed to change and I'm not allowed to believe what I want to believe one day and not the next day, then really I'm not free. So it's, it's personal for me. It's about my uh, ability to, to think and have freedom of conscience. And I want everybody to have that freedom. That's beautiful. Thank you. And Anne, can we turn to your work for a moment? Sure. Um, you fight climate change. How do you do that? What are your weapons in that fight? We do. Um, so we work locally to fight climate change. We promote clean energy and we fight dirty energy. And we, you'll see on our website, we use every tool in the toolbox. We petition, we call our legislators, we hold rallies, we litigate, uh, we, have, we get creative. We've held underwater press conferences in Annapolis to show legislators what Annapolis could look like in a couple decades if they don't act. Um, so we, we try to do as much as we can and get as creative as we possibly can. And when those things don't work, we also engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, we believe that that can be an effective strategy to make change. Right, and you had a few different uh, civil disobedience demonstrations this year, right? Um, I think in September, that was the largest one? We did, yeah. On September 23rd, I was partially responsible for interrupting your morning rush hour. Um, I was at the corner of Independence and 12th Street Southwest. I joined a couple hundred people at, or a hundred people at that intersection, and we had about 25 different affinity groups spread out across the entire city to shut down DC. Um, you know, we were there to make a point, and you know, we can't, in the face of the mounting climate crisis where you have extreme weather and flooding and wildfires that are taking people's lives, we can't afford to continue with business as usual. And so we were there to disrupt business as usual. Um, and that's what we did. So I, you know, I was out there blocking 14 lanes of traffic uh, for the morning rush hour with a couple hundred other people. Um, you know, the goal ultimately is to, is to make our members of Congress and our elected officials act like the planet and, uh, you know, everyone who lives on the planet depends upon them enacting strong legislation and taking the climate crisis seriously. We are not there yet, um, but we do, you know, we need to, in order to get there, we need to build a movement. And, you know, this, that's what the, that's what these events are about. That's what the civil disobedience actions are about is reaching more people and, you know, inspiring them and bringing them in. So when you're, wow, uh, 14 lanes of traffic, doesn't sound like too much fun. What's, what do you think the point is? Like, what can you accomplish by that kind of assembly, bringing those people there? Right. Well, I'm, ultimately, the goal is to get Congress to act like the planet and the people who live on it depend on it. Um, we're not there yet, but in, it does help us build this movement. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, do that through generating press, um, which we are doing effectively. You know, we don't... I've been involved in a number of protests, and you'll have the you know TikTok coverage of the event. But this has been more than that. There have been you know uh, columns about how this has happened in the past and the successes that they've achieved, um, and supportive local columnists writing about it. So we're reaching more people, um, and you know we're also bringing it to the streets. I mean, it's in it's an in-your-face action um, that's hard to ignore, and we we're growing. Um, you know, the most, I guess, famous climate activist right now is Greta Thunberg. Um, she, about a year ago, she was outside of the Swedish parliament alone at her uh, climate strike, school strike for the climate. A year later, six million people marched across the entire country, and that September 23rd action was part of the, uh, the climate strike that she's engaging in. And then, you know, it continues. Uh, we were out on the streets on Friday, and next Friday we'll be joining Jane Fonda, who is going to spend her 82nd birthday in jail, likely, um, fighting 
for climate for climate action with 81 other people she's planning on getting arrested. Wow. So we are <laughs> we are growing. Yes. <laughs> Plus, you know, bonus points for having several of the freedoms behind us involved right. in your right. actions and growing right. the movement. Um, and now I'd like to turn to our representatives from Bethesda Chevy Chase, BCC, I should probably mm -hmm. just say, um, who are no stranger to using their voices to make an impact. Um, I was wondering, Virginia, can you just tell me about what happened during your senior year? How did, how did this all start? So it all started one day in my history class. Someone came up to me and showed me a notes document on their phone, and it was a list with 18 names, and next to each name there's a number. And I was confused at first, and I asked the friend to explain to me what it was, and she said, it's a list. So it was ranking each one of us. It was all female students within the IB program by our physical appearances. And so this kind of spread like wildfire once everyone found out about it. And we all went to administration. We were like, we, we don't want this anymore. We, we're, we've had enough of being treated like this because this kind of culture is so common in high schools where people just objectify and will kind of treat girls as lesser. So we went to administration and we said, can we do something about this? And they were pretty limited in what they could do punitively. So we decided that within the IB program, which was about 80 seniors, we would have this sort of town hall meeting. It was supposed to last 45 minutes. It went three hours. And we just sat, and everyone who was on the list had an opportunity to say how this affected them, why they don't think this is acceptable. And people who weren't on it, who had similar stories, or just wanted to share their opinion, were able to do so in this sort of forum. That's, that's amazing. Usually when this kind of thing happens, people don't speak out about it. People don't raise that kind of attention. But Nicola, like I know that the uh, girls of the senior class um, did a lot more than just a single meeting. What happened after that? Yeah, so, well, initially, I think a lot of us were really upset and angry about what had happened. But when we got together as a large group of girls, um, we started to talk about how this had really made us feel and similar, um, similar things that we've experienced like this. And that's when we really realized that it was so much bigger than just, um, like just the list. It was a toxic culture. So we tried to engage the larger BCC family, um, like BCC parents and alumni students, through three um, events that we kind of uh, helped organize. So the first was a, BC, uh, a museum about um, toxicity that our generation experiences. Um, we also created a panel or helped organize a panel discussion um, with experts on toxic masculinity who are all um, former or parents of former BCC students. And we also uh, did, showed a movie screening of um, a, a documentary called Roll, Roll Red Roll. And um, which was about a girl in Ohio um, who was a rape victim. But um, when she came out about the, her story, she was instead shamed because this, the community saw this as just boys being boys. Um, and this was, I think, really important because um, it wasn't just a discussion that we helped create among, in the school. We also helped create a discussion that was much bigger that involved the whole community. And that's, that's great. And with uh, the school's reaction, Donna, like you were principal at the time, what was the administration's response to all this? Well, we um, heard from the young women about what had occurred and um, went about our processes of investigating the matter and um, talking to some of the students who were implicated. Um, and we were uh, following our code of conduct in terms of um, some of the things that we found. It was um, a list that was generated the year prior based on what we found in a, in a classroom um, on a text, um, sort of a text group chat. And, um, but what became clear um, in talking to the students is that this, a community of learners was really, really hurt by this, and it struck so many different chords. So it had to be, we, we had to be able to engage in discussion that was 
far beyond um, sort of a, you know, the, the code of conduct, um, but this stretched really well beyond the community. And so you heard about um, the, that initial meeting um, with those who were most directly um, impacted by what occurred. But then I was really, really just impressed in that meeting how the students were able to share very personal stories. And there was a lot of preparation that they did for the meeting um, where they really thought carefully about what they wanted to share. And there was a great deal of just courage and, um, and, and just a lot of truth that was shared. And that, that engagement actually had the effect of really changing the minds of the people involved. And it wasn't just those who were, and this is something I was most impressed with, it wasn't just maybe those who were most directly in term, uh, uh, involved in producing the list, but it was those who had known about the list and hadn't said anything um, for all that time, who had had that on their phones, um, who considered themselves friends, who, who knew. And so that idea that, um, you know, one of the, the quotes that I love, and it actually was brought forth in that meeting from Dr. Martin Luther King is not, you know, in the end, it's not the words of our enemies, but it's the silence of our friends. And I think that point was driven home so well um, that it really had an impact um, that was so great on all involved. And one thing that just struck me about the entire story is that it seemed like the students um, the girls were more interested in starting a dialogue and making people who were either involved or who were just standing there silently make them understand how they felt more than they were interested in demanding uh, harsher punishments. Why, why is that? If there's a way to answer that, that's for any of you. <laughs> I think that for us it was just, we know this isn't an isolated event. This happens everywhere, every single day. And just asking for punishment for this small group of boys isn't going to change anything. So we hoped that starting this dialogue and trying to get it as widespread as possible would be the most beneficial way to end or even just kind of start the beginning of the end of this. And we did that in our own school by having presentations that we gave to underclassmen. And so we kind of explained to them why these things aren't acceptable and just hoped to start a discussion within our own school and ended up sort of blowing up and national news outlets caught wind of that and then the discussion sort of became nationwide about toxic masculinity and why these things aren't acceptable anymore. That's great. I think that's the greatest hope for speech, that like by sharing perspectives, we can actually change minds with it. Um, and it's just wonderful to, that all of you have exercised your, your free expression rights in such a great, productive way. Um, so I have one last question for everybody, or, or nobody, if, if everybody's just trying to talk at this point. But what advice would you have for other people who want to affect a change in their communities or in the larger world? Do I get to go first again for the first? I mean, <laughs> it's a free for all. Anybody, freedom, pure freedom. Anyone can jump in. <laughs> um, for me, in, in, in religious liberty, I think being able to talk to fellow citizens another human being. See another human being as a human being first before you put a label on them. And so di civil discourse is the best thing um, for uh, religious freedom and also um, religious literacy, understanding other people. I used to have a pastor. I, we don't see eye to eye again. We don't have the same theology anymore. But uh, see, we have freedom. That's freedom. Um, <laughs> but he used to say this thing. He said, love seeks to understand, not be understood. And if you try to do that first, I think we can progress on all of these issues, not just religious liberty. I would say get creative and keep it fun. Um, you're not, you know, it's, it's hard work, and you're not always going to win. Um, and so, you know, doing the underwater press conference or, you know, you mentioned that blocking 14 lanes of traffic might not be that much fun. It was fun. It, <laughs> it, was, corrected. it was empowering, you know, to be with that many people and to, and to do but that for four hours. Was it more fun than the underwater press conference, though? Because that sounds amazing. It was more. Well... <laughs> 
I'm, it, cold water doesn't, is not my favorite thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep, keep it creative and as light as you can because, you know, this is tough work and um, you're not always going to win and you gotta, you got to have fun while doing it. Well, you helped me. I'm going to have to say this. You helped me because I started biking in. Oh, out okay. of the traffic. <laughs> so see, it's still climate Great. change and Great. everything worked that out. Was the point. Everything worked that, out. that was it. Everything worked out. I just need to do that to, you know, billions more people. <laughs> I'd say just never um, underestimate the, the power of your influence and even when you are able, have to kind of dig deep and um, explore and share things that are hurtful, I think that that can really um, help to change, um, to change people's minds. I think um, when you see something that upsets you and when you want to help try and create change around it, um, it's really easy to be angry, um, but I think that Anger won't help change a culture. You really have to go in with an open mind. Thank you. And with that, it looks like we're out of time, but that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you guys so much for sharing your stories. And now we'll hear from Jamie. Thank you to all of our panelists and speakers tonight. I hope you all will leave this program and this museum feeling inspired, energized, and optimistic about the future of the First Amendment and our most fundamental freedoms. I know, however, that many of you are concerned that the First Amendment is under threat. And you come to programs like this one tonight because you want to be part of the solution to protect it for future generations. As we've prepared to leave this building and look to the future, we've worked hard to redefine our purpose and our mission to consider new opportunities to make an impact, and to explore new ways in which we can foster First Amendment freedoms for all. Our next chapter has yet to be written, but it begins here tonight with all of you. We thank you for coming, and we invite you now to reception in the New York Times Ox Salzberger Great Hall of News, where we will celebrate the museum and the First Amendment and the spirit of the First Amendment in song, beginning with this moving rendition of This Land is Your Land. Thank you.